Hello everyone, my name is Brett Labello. I'm the Director of Regional History and Genealogy at Pikes Peak Library District. And I was, uh, wanted to welcome you to the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium today. Uh, the Regional History Symposium is our tight knit communities venue to catch up and enjoy speakers and talking about our topics. And I acknowledge that Zoom isn't the same as meeting all day at East Library. As we plan the symposium this year, we wanted to maximize the impact while also lessening the hardship of sitting through an all day long virtual event. We hope splitting it up into four monthly sessions helps. And if you can't make all the programs, they will be recorded and posted on PPLD's YouTube channel. We were also keenly aware that the magic of the symposium is based on all the quirks we all have, you included, and that we bring to the table. So we aim to bring that same specialness as we deliver this year's summer long Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium. Logistically, we will have three 20 minute presentations today. At the end of all three, we'll moderate a short Q&A with the presenters. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens um, to submit questions to the speakers. We hope you all use the chat as a discussion board, not with the speakers, but with one another. That's one of those perks for using virtual programming. You can talk during the presentation. Um, for a couple more remarks, I'd like to introduce John Spears, the PPLD CEO and Chief Librarian. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Pikes Peak Library District, uh, we're a nationally recognized system of public libraries that serves El Paso County. With 15 facilities, online resources, and mobile library services, we respond to the unique needs of individual neighborhoods and the community at large. This past year has been a difficult one for, for all of us, but also for the library. We have not been necessarily able to respond in the way that we can, but bringing back programs like this is one way that hopefully we and the community can return to some sense of normalcy. So in addition to everything that we've done through this pandemic, everything that we've done for the community for, for nearly a century, the library district possesses a long track record as a repository for our region's history. The history that's saved and preserved is the foundation for future generations. By preserving authentic and meaningful documents, images, and stories, future generations will have a foundation on which to build and know what it means to be a member of our community. History can help build community. As part of the community, this event is a product of the efforts of many who I want to recognize. Our sponsors are the Helen and James McCaffrey Fund for Regional History, the Friends of the Pikes Peak Library District, and the Pikes Peak Library District Foundation. We have partners such as Pikes Peak Community College, Pikes Peak Genealogical Society, Pikes Peak Posse of the Westerners, the Western Museum of Mining and Industry, and the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. None of this would be possible though without the staff of the Pikes Peak Library District. And I'd like to thank our communications department and the entire regional history and genealogy team. There's one person though that deserves special recognition from that group, and that is Chris Nickel. Chris Nickel is instrumental in the creation and the development of the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium. And she retired this year after 20 years of dedicated service to the community. Chris, if you're here, and hope you are, we miss you. <laughs> but we wanna give you our most gracious thanks for all of the hard work that you have put in through your many years with PPLD. So this is the first symposium in, in two years. And after a long break, we are so excited to resume the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium as we commemorate the sesquicentennial of the founding of Colorado Springs. I know you'll enjoy the great slate of speakers that we have scheduled throughout the summer. And I'd now like to introduce our first speaker. Catherine Scott Sturdivant is a professor of history at Pikes Peak Community College. She's taught US history there for almost three decades. She teaches Colorado, Western, American Indian, and women's history, among other topics. Kathy works frequently with PPLD and the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum on products. She's on projects, sorry. She has authored two books, many articles, and has won local, state, and national awards for her teaching excellence. As a social historian, Kathy advocates for diversity, equity, and inclusion. She's a previous Regional History Symposium presenter, author, and editor. So now I'd like to bring on Kathy Sturdivant, who will be presenting Instant Civilization, the engineer of progress and the magic early years of Colorado Springs. Kathy, thank you so much for being with us once again. Thank you, John. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, 
the title of this is has a lot of quotation marks and that's because for example instant civilization is a word from william jackson palmer and i will pull my joke right up front a lot of you know this joke from me our father who art in the intersection hallowed be thy name also think of progress but i have that in quotation marks because i'm saying i don't necessarily agree with everyone including palmer's definition of progress and i have magic in quotation marks because we feel this is magical this sesquicentennial but some of the things i'll be referring to are not necessarily magical in a positive way. I wanted to begin with a series of maps to make a big point quickly. Um, we are going to be talking primarily here about Palmer and the founding of Colorado Springs. But I wanted to make the point that there are millions of people living and passing through this area for centuries beforehand. So I'm showing you three maps that make that clear. You can see in these maps that there is a continuous presence of the Ute people. And you can also see that on the plains naturally because once the horse is introduced then cultures are based on plains buffalo hunting which is nomadic. You can see people passing through like the Apaches and Navajos who we normally think of as being more Southwestern or the Comanches and Kiowas who we normally think of as Texas, maybe Kansas people. So all of these folks left their mark. All of these folks are relevant and all of these folks deserve more attention than we tend to give them until recently. There's some preliminary information I just mainly wanted to put before your eyes. Um, so for example, realize that until 1821, the nationalistic definition of our area was Spanish empire, particularly once Santa Fe had been founded in 1598. During that time, we have the first significant US expedition, good old Zebulon Pike, so famous for reporting in his report ultimately about a peak that was striking. He did not name it himself after himself, of course. Um, he also thought the plains would be totally unsuitable for farming, which modern environmentalists might agree was a good shot. And he recommended that there could be trade between the United States and Santa Fe, which makes him a more recently realized leader or founder of the idea of the Santa Fe Trail. And between 1821 and 46, before the Mexican War, we're talking about an area, our area, that was part of Mexico. And that's the period you usually associate with the Santa Fe Trail and Bent's Fort, the Mexican War, the Pueblo Revolt, um, and the United States Conquest are between 46 and 48. Here's a map that helps remind us that there's a gold rush in the 50s named after our peak that actually didn't happen on our peak. And I've highlighted just to show you roughly that people were told when you come cross country to this area, to this gold rush, look for this amazing peak. And so Pike's Peak was the landmark, the gold rush got nicknamed for it, but the gold rush is actually to an area west of what is now Denver. That means our peak and our area were symbolic again, recognized again as very important. And of course that continues. Even before, again, the period that I'm most going to concentrate on, during that gold rush, we had initial development in the area. And most of this would be called old Colorado city area today. Those gold rushers came through, many stopped, and I'm making a joke here that's a theme of this presentation, which is that there's almost a convention and visitors bureau. There's almost something like a chamber of commerce in good old, old Colorado City, promoting the area, advertising it for its natural beauties and wonders and for its access to gold. So Fountain Creek is featured as it had been in many journals 
and recollections of people passing through before that. Um, the mineral springs, remarkable, of course, the garden of the gods, that it is the gateway to Ute Pass and the gateway to the South Park gold fields, uh, the latter being a bit of a stretch, but in any event, making the point that there are features of this area that should attract people. And then between the gold rush and the settlement and development of Colorado Springs is perhaps the most strikingly horrendous event in Colorado history, the most controversial. The Sand Creek Massacre, which of course is out east of where we are, to an extent that it might seem less connected than it was, it is a norm now in the field of history and many others to critique, as it happened at the time, uh, the military leader of those troops who killed innocent women and children, killing people who had turned themselves in as instructed by the governor of Colorado. So we hold accountable the military officer, Colonel John Chivington. We hold accountable the governor of Colorado, John Evans. But for our own local history, there is a controversy, which is one of the leaders of the community of Colorado Springs, one of the railroad tycoons, one of the developers, and certainly simply a community leader in the sense of a, a, a beneficent millionaire who looked upon the community as his and the community often looked upon him as theirs, Irving Halbert. Irving Halbert also wrote the first book that one reaches for if one goes to a library for a history of Indians in this area. Uh, he wrote the first real history of this area and placed in it his views of Sand Creek in which he was an armed participant. So we have controversies erupting today still about, and, and perhaps more conclusively today than they have in the past, about how we should handle that piece of information. But it is interesting to realize 64, that's only five years after that gold rush. And it's only, depending on which starting point you choose, um, five to seven years before Colorado Springs initial development. We need to see all kinds of themes that our local history is based on. And one of those is that it became a norm promptly after the Civil War with railroad development, that there would be railroad sponsored colonies along the way. And that these colonies just naturally needed to be irrigation colonies, that irrigation could be run, one hopes, um, by people collaborating in a colony and that it would be necessary in the Great Plains. So the famous one, the one we're most liable to study when we just look for a railroad irrigation colony in Colorado history is Union Colony, founded by the Union Pacific Railroad Sponsorship, founding a town named Greeley, not because Horace Greeley came to found it, but because that famous newspaper editor was the inspiration for this idea in many ways. And one of his editors uh, from the East came out to be the leader of it, Nathan Meeker in 1870. The superintendent of it, the manager of it, was a former Civil War general, Robert A. Cameron, who was also a newspaper publisher. He was the great developer of Greeley and he'd done such a good job. And look at the plains, by the way, in this wonderful picture. He did such a great job of starting that as a colony that would become a thriving community that when William Jackson Palmer came along, he snatched Cameron right up and brought him down to do the same here. So it's not just that Union Colony is um, an inspiration. It's not just that it's a first before um, our area. It's that it literally was planned based upon what had happened. Our community was literally planned based on what had happened there. And here comes William Jackson Palmer. William Jackson Palmer was a very successful Civil War general. I keep thinking that 
Civil War generals seem to have been the logical ones to appoint to run transcontinental railroad projects in a way similar to post-war decisions to put a general in the White House or put a general over a corporation. And this is the Kansas Pacific Railroad coming straight, well not straight obviously, but coming across Kansas affiliated with the Union Pacific under it. And this is the one that comes into our territory and state to make a settlement like Greeley along the way makes sense. But this is the one that Palmer is directing and it causes him to see the Great West as he wanted to do and realize he wants to do more with it. This is a good example of what the Kansas Pacific Railroad and the other transcontinental railroads did for which they are famous or infamous. Um, the buffalo herds were spectacular. The buffalo herds were greatest in those central plains areas that we live in or on the edge of. And the Kansas Pacific was going through some of the largest herds. Ironically, uh, with a feeling of doom, I can tell you that William Tecumseh Sherman, yes, that general, when he was riding the Kansas Pacific, said that he rode for as many as 170 miles without ever coming out of one single huge buffalo herd. So these buffalo were obviously, to a man like Sherman, going to be realized as what he called the commissary of the plains. It became ultimately a goal to diminish their size as much as possible, not by the happenstance of settlement, but deliberately and purposefully as a way to conquer Native Americans on the plains. So you see the beginnings of that here, because if you look closely, this is a very short train from the Kansas Pacific in the years right immediately after its completion. And this is full of men who are on an excursion. These are city slickers who are going out to the West to have the thrill of wastefully killing a buffalo because it wasn't possible to bring back the hides or much meat or a head or anything trophy-like in any large numbers at all. Ultimately, cartloads of skins and then cartloads of bleached bones, once they became that, would be gathered and taken back east. We also need to know about Palmer's wife, Queen. And this is a famous letter that he wrote to her. Um, notice that he's saying about our space here, why he wants to build a community here. And it's near the Soda Springs in the Garden of the Gods. So he's focusing on the same features. It's in a direct line along the railroad. Well, it's a direct line along the railroad he's about to build, which would be his north-south line down from the Kansas Pacific. And also that it's going to be great for agriculture. And then he's saying, you think you can look over after this colony we're going to build along with the other colonies we're going to build? And he's saying, It'll only be an um, hour each day to horseback to ride back and forth and probably run the colony. And although he's teasing, there are ways he wasn't. And isn't she lovely? And isn't she young? One thing to always connect our local history with is this amazing painting, this chromolithograph from 1872 by George Profoot. And notice his title, American Progress. John Gast is the painter, Profit is the publisher. Profit was very admiring of Palmer. And you can see that they think the same way. So we have American Progress in her lovely gown floating overhead. And as you can see, Native Americans and buffalo and other wildlife are driven out as part of progress. Miners, you see the stages that some historians, notably Frederick Jackson Turner, believe the Western expansion happened in. Miners and homesteaders, or the transportation stages, covered wagons, Pony Express, stagecoach, and of course, ultimately railroad. By the way, she's carrying telegraph wire. And we discovered in a symposium a few years ago, we always thought that the book must be the Holy Bible. When you enlarge the picture enough, it says, 
school book. So I'm going to read this for you quickly. This is General Cameron's remarks upon leading the Colorado Springs Company in the opening of our town. If there were to be presented no other inducements why men and families should emigrate to this spot, that of health alone is sufficient. The sick are restored to health, pale faces assume tints of roses, the aged renew their youth and are filled with fresh vigor and new life. This favored spot, sheltered by the divide from the storms of the north, is soon to blossom into gardens of beauty. Here will rise groves and orchards. Let us not forget the magnificent scenery around us. Before us looms up Pike's Peak. Within sight of us on the right are the Garden of the Gods, Glen Erie, and Monument Park. The Denver and Rio Grande Railway is about to bring it into close and convenient communication with all parts of the East. Springs well known to the Aborigine of the days that are gone around these springs, thousands of painted war chiefs with their followers casting in their tributes of gold and silver. So we drive the first stake home inside of Pikes Peak Glorious Dome in Colorado Springs, new town, the future city of renown. And there's our lovely stake that you can go see. And there's what it looked like. The company, and I'll just choose some highlights here. The company picked the town site. The company laid the first stake or drove it. Um, here's what you had to do. You immediately could buy a $100 membership a residential lot, $50, a business lot, $100. You could live in a colony cabin, which was a little shack provided. And by the end of the first year, if you paid your balances and showed proof of improvements, it was yours. The company provided irrigation. We really did benefit as a developing community from the notion that irrigation was important, that these men understood. And there it is. <laughs> It was to be a dream city, a city of trees. And so they advertised right away for 5,000 young round leaf cottonwoods with good roots. This sounds actually like the trees are supposed to march forward, but obviously people are supposed to dig them up and drag them in. Um, all the town residents, we know this, had to be good moral character and have temperance habits. And the deeds did carry and still do that liquor prohibition. It was to be the city of churches, it was to be the greatest university city in the West. I'm not sure we did that. It was supposed to have a women's college like Vassar. But Colorado College did open right away. Out West Magazine, which we now treat like the predecessor to the Gazette Telegraph, was created to publicize it. And it became the county seat. That building still stands, thank goodness. That's the real depot of the Denver and Rio Grande. It really is. That's from way long ago. We need to keep saving it. Thank you owners for saving it. Queen did open the first school. It took a two hour ride every day, back and forth twice to do that. She also was in charge of the first Christmas celebration in the town. She brought culture and her English friends, particularly the Kingsleys and opera, and she was a beautiful singer herself. And so this is a sketch by her friend Rose Kingsley from England, who portrayed what it was like to stay in this initial phase of the community. The Colorado Springs Hotel opened on New Year's Day, 1872, and these are some of the Kingsleys standing there. And remember, speaking about health and how this place was going to be so healthy. Remember that there is another colony next door that Palmer had in mind and was developing, whose history I'm not making a big deal of right at this moment, but maybe we'd be doing that next year. This is Dr. William Bell. And Dr. William Bell was a London doctor. And like many Londoners, many Englishmen was interested in the opening of the West. So he had wanted to come on one of those train construction trips. The Kansas Pacific didn't need a doctor. It did need a photographer. And so William Bell hurried up and taught himself photography so that he could go on that journey. And he met William Jackson Palmer. They became partners in the business of developing these springs. 
as an additional colony next to the colony that was called Fountain Colony and then Colorado Springs. And you can see the beginnings of that. And realize that naming practices and practices regarding the romanticization of the Native American people who had been treated so differently so recently um, occur for Manitou, obviously, as well. This is a Native American name purposefully given to it to imply that sacred connection between the Native peoples and the holy and healthy springs. It's also a name not famous so much for the local area at the time, but famous for the poem Hiawatha. So everyone might realize the connection. So the development spirit, the community building spirit, uh, the utopian emphasis, the always exaggerated chamber of commerce type language um, was all part of both communities. Of course, Palmer had his beautiful home picked out. Remember that if you ever fall for any of the local criticism that has occurred over the years of Queen Palmer, and Queen was her given name by her family, by the way, um, it's not that she turned down living in the castle. The castle didn't exist right away. She lived in stables and lofts and cabins beforehand in this nice house. Um, there are apocryphal stories, and I don't know how many of these really are that or are genuine, but supposedly she was visited there uh, in, the, in the canyon by Utes and made friends with them, even though she'd been frightened as many Eastern women would be, uh, by giving them cookies. Uh, it's, I don't know how true that is, um, but I do think it's, it's at least probable that she had that interaction and that she made it positive and they made it positive. Um, she also is supposedly responsible for inspiring many of our earliest street names and that they should be names of Indian origin and also Western experience. So I think we owe that um, genuine quality of our naming practices perhaps to her. And all the things that he said he wanted to do should give us this romantic feeling again of how he was feeling about the West. But there's also that little warning discomfort here about the attitudes toward indigenous people. He wanted to create a preserve in the canyon near their country home to keep as memories of a bygone day, a herd of buffalo, a herd of pronghorn antelope, Indian people, living together and practicing their culture for people to see, and a prairie dog tail. And here he is, the man who sprung up instant civilization, very much a post-war belief that he could do that. He is an engineer. He's a longtime railroad fanatic, we would say today. Um, and he believed in social engineering. So transportation and city building go together, irrigation, modifying the environment so that it would be ideal for an ideal society. Um, he also accepted that progress includes removal. And as we study the development of any town like ours, it includes a removal of previous human beings and the incorporation of them as the dominating culture sees fit and the removal of cumbersome wildlife. But again, let's have a symbolic herd of buffalo for people to look at. He also was very much a booster, although he was dignified enough that he tended not to display this himself, except quite a bit in writing. And so the features, the health, the tourism, the scenery and the tourism, agriculture and business, and a wholesome lifestyle. And I want everyone to realize that when you romanticize, and this is something that, that many of us who teach are trying to bring to greater attention today, when you romanticize a previously conquered, quote unquote, uh, group of people, you probably do not think you're doing any harm. 
as I don't think that a General Palmer would have seen it that way, which is part of the problem. That leads to com commodifying people or even the buffalo or anything else that we decide is fruitful for the community growth. We turn it into a commodity, to an asset of the community without necessarily seeing the human beings involved as like ourselves. And to talk a little bit about Palmer in that category of how do we judge and judging people in history, I mean, interpret, um, but we do judge too. This is a man who was a very passionate, intense abolitionist before the Civil War as a Quaker. He fought verbally with his very devout Quaker family and very devout Quaker meeting because he very devoutly as a Quaker thought the best thing he could do against slavery was fight in the Civil War against it. And so he took up arms even though Quakers were pacifists. Later in life, he also became a member of groups that were anti-imperialist when looking at something like the Philippines or Cuba, Spanish-American War. He didn't think it was right to intrude on those cultures, even though he once sort of did that to build a railroad across Mexico himself. He looked at it as a culturally irresponsible thing or wrong thing to do. So we see some people, and I think William Jackson Palmer is one of these, as having a mixture of beliefs, some of which are, we are more comfortable with today and some of which we are less so. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the sesquicentennial. Thank you very much, Kathy. And I wanted to say that that's a fantastic context, a great way to kick off the symposium. Uh, slate of speakers this year um, to really give it, you know, a, a good foundation. Um, to stress to everybody else, I've already seen this a little bit um, in the chat. You guys are doing a great job of using the chat to sort of keep. Uh, communication going, uh, having a little bit of a running dialogue down there, but also use that Q&A function. At the end of the, all the presentations, we'll jump back to the Q&A um, and we will ask some questions to the panelists. Okay, so that's our plan. Um, you guys are doing it already. I'd like to see that. Um, so I think at this point I can actually introduce our second speaker and that's Steve Plute who is an avocational historian who has lived in Lake George, Colorado for the past 47 years. A popular speaker, Steve has presented his research to historical societies and centers throughout the Pikes Peak region, region ranging from Cripple Creek, Old Colorado City, U Pass, and the Pikes Peak Historical Society to the city of, Wood, of Woodland Park, Chamber of Commerce, the Lake George Charter School, and the Lake George Public Library. Steve will be presenting the Lake George Ice and Power Company. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Plute, and my presentation today will focus on the ice industry in Colorado Springs in the late 19th and early 20th century. Today, we tend to take crystal clear ice for granted. Most of our refrigerators even dispense it right from its door. But our ancestors didn't have it quite that easy. There was a time when ice was a very big deal and the beginning of the ice har harvest season was an exciting event that employed a lot of workers. In fact, at its peak, the ice trade in the United States employed an estimated 90,000 people. So if you will, for a few moments, use your imagination and think about a hot midsummer's day in Colorado Springs in the year 1880. You're 10 years old, and you and your family live in a nice Queen Anne style home north of downtown on a quiet Cascade Avenue. Suddenly, you hear the clip clop, clip clop sound of a horse drawn wagon coming your way. Oh boy, you say to yourself, the Iceman. You jump down off your porch and run out into the street and greet him as he pulls his two stout horses to a stop. The brawny Iceman gets down from his wagon and as always, rewards you with a few pieces of ice. What a great day this is for you and the rest of the neighborhood kids standing around the wagon. 
ice, you think to yourself, in the middle of July. Well, that scene was played out all across the United States in those days. Ice was a vital commodity and was one of the leading industries here in Colorado Springs. It was even considered a weapon of defense when it came to protecting the public's health against spoiled foods. In the Pikes Peak region, most family farms outside of town had ponds and would cut and store their own ice. However, folks living inside of Colorado Springs had ice delivered to them. It was sold by weight and the ice man brought it right into your kitchen and fit it into your ice box. Once in place, your perishables, such as milk, butter, eggs, and meat products were kept fresh. When your household needed ice, which was usually on a daily or at the most every other day basis, a card was put into your window and the ice man knew to make a stop at your house. Ice, along with ice boxes, also led to a healthier change in everyone's dinner and eating habits. And to the grumbling of some, leftovers were now a much more common item. Besides keeping your food fresh, if the ice was pure enough, it made a cold beverage possible in the heat of the summer. It was quite a treat to sit out on your porch on an August evening watching the horse-drawn carriages go by while sipping your favorite ice cold drink. By the 1890s, all but the poorest residents had ice boxes and nearly every home and business used ice to some degree. Hotels and restaurants were big consumers of ice and many of them kept a good supply on site in their own small ice houses. Railroads were also big clients, using it for moving perishables from farm to market. They also had their own ice houses that were fully stocked from ice wholesalers. The typical ice house was essentially a barn built within a barn, and it was packed with sawdust in between the two for insulation. A well-insulated ice house would experience about a 20% loss by the end of summer, while a poorly insulated one would lose about 50% of the product. One of the first wholesalers of ice in Colorado Springs was the Fountain Ice Company. Since the temperatures on the front range were not low enough early on in the winter, the harvesting season around Colorado Springs was pretty short. The cutters needed at least 12 inches of thickness for the safety of the many men and teams of horses on the ice, and also to get the size of blocks desired. Because of the short season, ice wholesalers would often work long hours cutting nonstop seven days a week until the harvest was completed or warm weather shut it down for the season. Additionally, the quality of the front range ice was not always what customers demanded, especially hotels and restaurants. Contamination was the issue with things like moss, pine needles, and other pollutants trapped in the cut ice blocks. Not to mention that it wasn't uncommon for folks back then to dump garbage, trash, and raw sewerage into the streams and creeks. Here is an ad from local retailer T.E. Johnson promoting the quality of his ice that was cut over at Cheyenne Canyon. It reads, my ice was not cut from Divide Lake, but was cut from ponds constructed on Cheyenne and is free from alkali and other impurities. It had no bad, bad surroundings such as outhouses, pig pens, slop from section houses, etc. Signed T.E. Johnson. Well, another source of contamination was the ice cutters themselves. Their horses, that is. Since horses will be horses, precautions were taken to keep the ice clean and hygienic, and someone had to clean up after them. The person who did that was called the shine boy. His job was to scoop up the manure and put it into a sled that he pulled behind him. Then he would pour formaldehyde on the area to supposedly kill any germs or contamination that was left on the ice. The Divide Lake mentioned in the ad is north of Colorado Springs in the Monument Palmer Lake area. In the early days, that area was one of the very first sources of ice for the new fountain colony and was cut and hauled by Mr. S.C. Foote and sold here in town. 
the T.E. Johnson in this ad was an early and major longtime ice dealer here in the Springs. Timothy Johnson was one, also one of the first settlers here. He built some ponds and an ice house on his land that Cheyenne Creek ran through over by Cheyenne Canyon. Later, he also built a large ice house on Werfano Street with a capacity of 900 tons for summertime sales. He also sold spring water and was a large milk dealer here too. The Union Ice and Coal Company was founded by Johnson on West Bermaho. Prior to the end of the 1870s, competition among local ice dealers was evident by some of the local ads. Here is a June 9th, 1877 ad by Mr. Johnson where he pans his competitor, Mr. J.B. Riggs. It reads, I some time ago made Riggs' agent, Duncan and Forbes, this proposition. Each one put up $50 and have the water analyzed, the one having the softest water to take in the set stakes, the other party to defray the expense of the analysis. I extend this proposition to Duncan and Forbes to have the ice analyzed for purity. The nearer to Cheyenne Creek, the better the water. Fence in and bottle some of this light air, Brother Riggs. You may be able to humbug someone, sign T. E. Johnson. In FYI, the word humbug in those days meant to trick or to deceive someone. And then local ice dealer and competitor Charles Stockbridge also put out ads about the quality of his ice. It reads, not to be outdone by anyone, I propose putting up a significant quantity of ice next season to supply the entire neighborhood and can assure my numerous customers that I will not be undersold, even if I have to give it away. I can afford to work cheap as the teams and working materials belong to me and not to my mother-in-law. Respectfully, Charles Stockbridge. Well, there were many ice houses and ice dealers in and around Colorado Springs through the years. Prospect Lake, for example, had a large 600 ton ice house that was built in 1909 to store ice cut from that lake. Ice houses also spawned another business enterprise, which was the buying and hauling of sawdust from area sawmills. The sawdust was used not only as insulation in the buildings, but also to cover the blocks of ice and preserve them. Contamination was still a problem every year, and it wasn't until after the Colorado Midland Railroad came into existence that a cleaner and much purer ice became available to Colorado Springs. On a daily basis from the springs, the Midland was steaming in and out of 11 Mile Canyon. That was when local rancher George Frost thought of the possibilities of a successful ice cutting business. So in 1891, he dammed up the South Platte River at the mouth of 11 Mile Canyon and built what was later to be named Lake George. And Lake George, as you probably know, is a very small, tiny town about 40 miles west of Colorado Springs on Highway 24. Its elevation is 8,000 feet and sits in what the Forest Service meteorologist calls a cold sink. And it has some of the coldest extreme temperatures on the eastern slope of Colorado. From mid-December through mid-February, during what I would call a normal winter, it is below zero almost every morning. George Frost, by the way, was born on July 3rd, 1843 in Massachusetts and was a Civil War veteran coming to Colorado in the early spring of 1886. So after the completion of the lake, a very large ice house was constructed beside the east edge of the water. The Lake George Ice Company produced ice that was of a most superior quality and purity, which in turn made it the preferred ice in the Pikes Peak region and beyond. A big customer of the mountain ice was the Citizens Ice Company of Colorado Springs. They signed a contract that would provide them with 25,000 tons of ice per year. Citizens also built a 10,000 ton ice warehouse at the corner of Sierra Madre and Marino Streets. In this Gazette ad from 1910, it boasts about the ice at Lake George. At the bottom of the ad, it tells that Lake George ice is a natural ice 
taken from the famous Lake George, and that it has a statewide reputation of being absolutely pure, clear ice, free from all impurities, and absolutely without any contamination. It closes saying that Lake George ice is the finest in the state. The restaurants and hotels of both Colorado Springs and Manitou absolutely preferred and loved Lake George ice. The famous crystal clear blocks of Lake George ice begin with a large workforce of men and horses out on the frozen lake. The ice business in Lake George employed anywhere from 75 to over 200 men to cut and store the ice. George Frost annually sold tens of thousands of tons of ice to the Colorado Midland Railroad and other railroads such as the Rock Island, Rio Grande, and the Santa Fe. Besides Colorado Springs, Lake George Ice also went to the cities of Pueblo and Denver and many more places along the Front Range and Eastern Plains. One year, they even shipped 24,000 tons to Chicago. Lake George Ice allowed the Broadmoor's wealthy visitors to sip cool drinks in the hot Colorado Springs summers. Lake George Ice was even shipped to Rocky Ford for packing their famous melons. Every year, over 100,000 tons of ice was cut from Lake George and the supply seemed inexhaustible. Well, once harvest season began around late December or early January, one of the first chores was to clear the harvest area of the frozen snow. Usually a conventional farmer's disc was pulled behind horses to break up the snow. Then horses would pull a scraper, which was called a Fresno, that cleared the snow down to the glare ice. After snow and any other debris were cleared, a set of checkerboard grid lines were then laid out. This allowed a special horse-drawn plow to make deep grooves in the ice with a scorer. This photo here is the actual Lake George as the men and teams score the ice. And here's a better look at the score. At the bottom of each plate was saw-like and it took deep penetrating bites. And after a few passes with a score, the workers would then start cutting the ice along the grid lines with their hand saws. And the results were called ice, ball, ice cake, excuse me. The Lake George, the, when the blocks were cut, the cakes were never hand lifted out of the water, but floated from the harvest area to a steam powered conveyor belt at the shoreline. To do this, channels were cut into the ice and the cakes were pushed along by many men spaced out alongside these channels using pike poles. Once at the shore, the pike poles would be used to push the cake blocks from the water onto the partially submerged conveyor belt system for transport up to the ice house. These ice cakes were crystal clear on the sides of each block, but the top still had some frozen snow on them, even after the Fresno cleared the lake. So to free all debris on the top part and to square up the bottom, the ice cakes went through a planer and that was positioned on the conveyor belt that trimmed off the frozen slush and snow and made the blocks symmetrical and crystal clear. Another conveyor belt system was positioned below the planer and carried away the frozen shavings and ice chips that the planer produced. In this photo, you can see the cakes going up the main conveyor, through the planer, and up to the ice house. You can also see the conveyor that carries away the planer chips going to the left. The tower seen on the left of the photo supports the top of the conveyor belt and has a pulley system and cable that runs to the steam engine which turns the belt. Once the cakes made it to the desired opening of the building, they were shuffled to the chosen storage area of the ice house. After the blocks of ice were placed in the ice house, sawdust was spread around and over the blocks for added protection. In this, in this photo here, uh, boxcars are seen on the siding in front of the Lake George Ice House taking on ice. 45 to 50 cars a day were shipped from Lake George with each car capable of holding 23 tons. And that's a lot of ice. And here's a couple more pictures. That's the Lake George Ice House. And this next one, you can see the railroad tracks 
right there in front. In 1918, the Colorado Midland Railway ended 31 years of service. A small number of freights ran for a few more years to Lake George for ice, but in the fall of 1921, the scrap train was ripping up the entire system except from Divide to Colorado Springs. With rail service terminated, that marked the end of the ice cutting business in Lake George. But the industry of supplying natural ice from area ponds and lakes was doomed anyways, even long before the Midland went out of business. It was back on May 6, 1851, that Dr. John Gorey was granted the first US patent for mechanical refrigeration. And although it was far from practical, it did lay the groundwork for modern refrigeration. In the summer of 1891, T.E. Johnson built an artificial ice plant at his Union Coal Company. Uh, the plant was later sold, and in 1901, a new $50,000 building was built at the northwest corner of Vermaho and Swatch. Inside that building was installed a $30,000 ammonia plant which produced 30 tons of ice per day, making it at the time the largest ice plant in Colorado Springs. In 1897, the El Paso Ice and Coal Company of Colorado Springs was also selling artificial ice. And by the 1930s, the industry of cutting natural ice had pretty much ran its course. And today, we are far from moved from the labor-intensive industry of providing natural ice to area residents. I'm sure that ice is probably taken for granted by most of us, and it is, as it is merely a convenience available at the push of a button. Well, I hope you enjoy this bit of Colorado Springs history as much as I enjoyed presenting it. And thank you very much, and thank you to the Pikes Peak Regional History History Symposium for all of their hard work as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Fountain Colony, the city of Colorado Springs. And uh, thank you, Chris Nichols, and thank you, everyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I can think that I can echo the statements that are going, that are flying back and forth in the chat. Uh, I don't think I had any idea how intense this, you know, getting ice was. It is something that I think that we all take for granted. And just seeing all those steps in the, in the huge process is unbelievable. Um, so I think uh, to echo something else, you guys are doing a fantastic job with the Q&A in the chat. Um, we are a quick study of this group. Um, I really, uh, like it. Um, and hopefully we've got enough time to really dive into the Q&A at the end. Um, so that's a, a perk and a benefit. Okay, well, we'll get on to our next presenter. Doreen E. Martinez is of Mescalero, Apache, and Pennsylvania Dutch lineage. The first of her family to pursue formal education, she is a professor in Native American Studies at Colorado State University. Her work focuses on how cultural knowledge is lived and practiced in, in everyday contemporary locations and situations. Using her formal background in sociology, personal experience, and cultural values rooted in ind indigeny, Doreen has taught indigenous knowledge, systems, gender, and race theory, research message, methods, race, class, and gender in media, and many other courses. Uh, she will be presenting historicizing indigenous presence, footprints, artifacts, ways of being and knowing today. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you, uh, appreciate the opportunity to join you all here on a Saturday morning um, in which I'm also very um, um, graciously appreciative of that you've chosen to spend your Saturday morning with us. Um, as Brett said, you know, my background is um, as a professor and um, I am up at Colorado State University, um, but I am Muscalero Apache. Um, and Pennsylvania Dutch, which is a, its own history um, to make mention of. It's, it's a little strange for me to do this presentation because I don't see anybody. Um, so if I fumble a little bit, it's part of that. I'm a very visual person and responding to, to those cues is something that's important to me. Um, I, t I actually uh, wanted to start off my presentation just briefly with when I teach the Native American history class, 
um, here up at Colorado State University. I always started off with this song. So I'm going to play just a few seconds for it. I'm going to prep you. Literally, when I'm in the class, I don't even prep it because they are there to um, participate in the Native American history class. But I just wanted to let you all know that this is a song that I'm intentionally playing because Zoom at times we have these things happen that are technology issues and it's not a technology issue. I'm intentionally going to play a little bit of this song. Um, it's from a tribe called um, Red, which they also now um, refer to themselves as the Hallucination. And it's actually the song is the Stadium Powwow. So I'm going to play this just a little bit. Okay, so that's that it's a three minute song um i wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of that and part of this is you know when when i teach um the work that i do is really about understanding from a native perspective so this is this idea of historicizing that history is living that history is actually something in which we continue to integrate and understand regarding our lives today. So this is a contemporary song, but it's very much a historical song because of the instruments that are played, even the beat that's happening. Um, I gotta, I'm gonna put the link in because somebody actually just posted that they didn't hear the song. So I'm not sure what happened there, but I will put the link in the chat in just a second. Um, cause I was hoping that somebody else would have heard that. Um, usually it works that way. But um, again, the main emphasis that I'm trying to do here is to give you an idea of a living history that's so important to indigenous peoples, literally through music, which is certainly one of the other things that we would say is critical to our understanding of um, how our values, ideologies, our um, practices are. So I'm gonna get into that. I'm gonna see if we can get that um, video up there for you all. But if I can get the next slide, I want to kind of, again, give a, a little bit more um, information regarding my topic and, and presentation today. I'll try to slow down a little bit because I get a little rushed sometimes when we start these things off. Um, since time immemorial, it has been the Sun Mountain, a recognition of presence, a recognition of awakening of new days and relationships between beings, plural, knowings, plural. Yet Pikes Peak is the name on highway and street signs on maps and GPS, on awards and conferences, and in meaning and in, in erasure. So this is one of the things that I wanna flush out a little bit more is that we have this even historical knowledge in which people will make reference to others that were here before Pikes Peak, but there's such a way in which, you know, the presence of indigenous peoples, that presence of um, Brett, the, the, the word there in my bio is indigeneity, and it's a word that we use heavily in our, our, our spaces because it invokes action and it invokes um, um, a verb, it invokes some ways in which we're engaged, not just indigenous as a noun. So indigeneity is how do we practice these things? So when I was looking at putting together this presentation, I wanted to look at Pikes Peak specifically, but also look at some kind of key themes. So Pikes Peak, again, it had a name before. It was the Sun Mountain, you know, and there's, we know this too. We do know this and it is written down and it has been evidenced, yet it's still in so many places just being named um, and recognized as Pikes Peak. The second um, quote here on this slide, again, the first part is, is what I said I was going to cover. I'm going to start to get into that by some of these quotes. But in our day, this, there's these beliefs. This is um, Holmberg's mistake. Easy way to Google this, literally just Holmberg's, Holmberg's mistake. And it comes up um, pretty quickly because it was a, he's a journalist that in the 1400s put out this understanding of indigenous peoples that in very many ways did this impact. That the beliefs about indige indigenous peoples and about Indians is that we are inherently simplistic and there was an innocence 
um, in that. So there's the, the reference is mainly to the punitive lack of impact on the environment. So again, I'm going to thank you, Brett, for pulling up that link for that song. I get like, you know, multiple things going on and they get all kind of anxious that I didn't do that. So I'm going to, again, focus on this quote. The idea about indigenous people. So it isn't just so much, are they there? Are they not? Do we have a map? But what are the ways in which we understand how we interpreted that presence? How did we understand those footprints? How do we understand the artifacts? So again, in the 1400s, we already had this journalist has been putting out all this information that says, in our day, again, in the 1400s, the beliefs about Indians is that they're inherent, that, that are their inherently simplistic simplicity and innocence refer mainly to the punitive lack of impact on the environment. So what he's saying there is that because we can't see the way in which they impacted the environment, we then don't understand literally their history. I think it's really important to point out that is because this is one of those things. How do we see the footprints if I haven't, if I don't have the same structures or if I don't have where I've cleared out where now I'm gonna have an avenue, a road IE, how is it that we're seeing indigenous peoples and not just our histories historically, but the ways in which that ties in contemporarily. So we're going to move to the next slide. Um, and again, I'm going to give you context in terms of things that are out there. And then I'm going to give you context in terms of how we want to understand and interpret that. And I will give you other um, ideas. So one of the ways in which people learn about native um, individuals, native nations, native histories is what we teach our kids. And this is what's happening in schools. So this is literally from a website and it's called Native Americans for Kids. On the top left is the quote that it has. It's how do we know about their history? The Native Americans did not write down or record their history. So we have to find out about their history in other ways. Today, archeologists are able to learn a lot about past cultures by digging up artifacts such as tools and weapons. But much of what we know comes from recordings of the first Europeans to arrive. We can also learn from traditions and stories that have been passed down within the tribes from generations to generations. So we can see that there's an effort to do some of this work in terms of how do we teach, um, particularly children, about Native Americans. But what you'll see is that they're often accompanied by these pictures also, where the pictures end up highlighting particular ways of understanding history. So this, this image is actually called the Three Chiefs. So we get a lot of pictures of chiefs you know, we get a lot of pictures of headdresses and teepees and horses, right? So although we're under uncovering some of this, even that we uncover tools and weapons says something very specific, specific about what we seek to find and then understand by those findings. So further then on the bottom, Holmberg talks about this and that implicitly we depict Indians as people who never changed their environment from its original wild state because history is about change. And they were people without history then. So again, so this whole, this whole premise that I need to see somehow a presence is then imported on how we actually capture that history. If I don't see a change, because history has changed. Think about that. History is the recording of change. We actually just had two presentations that very much illustrated that in terms of change around naming the city, putting the stake in the ground, putting things physically in those spaces that said, this is our city, um, creating companies in terms of ice that then say, here's the way we change. Here's the way in which we actually progressed. So that's what you're seeing in this slide. And again, we, we're knowing that we need to teach some things and find some things, but are we doing it in a way that, that actually is then telling a story that isn't truly the story that's there? And again, I'll give you some more examples of that, but we can go ahead with the next slide. So, so in this work, you know, I seek to explore, this is again, the italicizes me, um, the metaphor and action and how we embed value systems in those things. So what are the particular footprints and what are the particular artifacts that can at best locate an object or a past notion of life? So I'm going to give you some examples too. So, and again, you're going to be able to read this. As I said, this is going to be taped, so I'm not always going to reiterate everything that's there. But I think that one of the meanings that we can see is that even uh, early on, you know, in many different places, you might see that people will talk about Native peoples as nomads. And it's really a word that has a particular influence, right? 
that nomad people think that, oh, they didn't have homes and they just kind of constantly were on the move. And that really is a word that actually says something that's contrary to what indigenous peoples were doing, in which they had establishment and they went with seasons, they went to hunting areas. At, at times I feel like, would we ever call people nomads because you drive to grocery stores instead of like finding food in your backyard? So we just have to be careful about the language because there's value orientations in that. So again, in the quote here, we're gonna see what happens around this. There's a common complaint among colonizers was that indigenous peoples did not properly subdue the natural environment. And what you can understand by this language of subduing the natural environment, this actually heavily comes from Christianity and that it was the role of good Christians to have dominion over the land and subdue it for their purposes. You know, that it really was progress, i.e. in the United States, is very much about capitalism. So the, no the notion that Native people did not properly use the land and hence has no title to it forms the basis of the doctrine of discovery which is the foundation of which much of the U.S. case law regarding Indian land claims. I think that from even their conversations um, already today, Pikes Peak is exactly this. Manitou Springs, in some ways, I think is striking because Manitou Springs, as, as um, Catherine mentioned, is named with a kind of a reverence or kind of a, a, an honoring of indigenous peoples. So it's named that, but we forced them all out. So, so there's this, this juxtaposition there, I think that's really striking in terms of this doctrine of discovery. And again, the doctrine of discovery gives permission to move people out. So that image of the, uh, of the, of the woman of progress, right? And we can see that Buffalo being moved out, Native peoples being moved out. And it's done in this way in which we don't talk about it in, in regards to the violent history of that. It's done in a way in which that's progress. So that's part of what you're seeing as an example here. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm gonna just do these really quick because this is presence. This is still this idea of like, when you see pictures, this is what you see. You know, everybody is seeing literally, you know, again, the picture on the left, it's chiefs again. And these pictures are from museums. Um, there's a couple, the, some of the information I'm pulling specifically Pikes Peaks museums, but the one on the left is actually a museum in Kentucky. The one on the right actually is a museum in Kansas. But I think that these are the pictures that you see. Literally, you Google Native American history. These are the images that come up. And left side, chiefs, heavily, 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 you know, part of that narrative. I think the right side actually is depicting probably something that's similar to like a Sundance. But I think when people quickly look at this, because we always have to pay attention to our audience, I don't think they're seeing this as like a, a, as a fun thing until you stop for a second and maybe look that they're dancing versus the people in the middle, if you look quickly, could be look like they're tied up, particularly because this larger narrative about the kind of hostility of natives. So this is something that's really, you know, important. So these are the pictures you get. The quote, though, from an indigenous people is that the Americas was immeasurably busier, more diverse, and more populous than researchers had seriously imagined. We actually know that now, and I have some more information on that, but we know that, but we still get these very stereotypical, very common, possibly the romantic kind of pictures in which were mentioned previously. Next slide, please. Um, and again, I'm giving you some quotes and substance and then the counterpoint, but here again, here's my point. Again, do Native American history images. These are the images you get. I, these are the ones I pulled. So left side, we finally get pictures of Native women. And actually, that picture is on Pinterest of all places, which I think is striking in terms of when we finally get a picture of women, but it's also titled Beautiful Native American Women. So then women can only exist in a visual when they're identified literally in this kind of tokenistic body imagery. Like here are the beautiful ones, and that's why we're showing you. It is women on the, on the right also, yet it's them again on horses with the teepee in the background. So we want to look at, again, some context here, which I'm giving you regarding these, these pictures and this work, is that you know, Samuel Ellis, who is, again, a Pulitzer Prize winner. And what's important about understanding the journalist's roles here is that this is the primary way many people were understanding Native individuals, right? We weren't doing this particularly in schools. We were doing it through these journalistic um, um, offerings. But that in, in the two-volume um, European Discovery America, he has this very succinct claim that Indians had created no lasting monuments or institutions. And that they were imprisoned in changeless wilderness, 
They were pagans expecting to be short and brutish in lives, void of hope for future. Native people's chief function in history, the historian Heber Trover Roper proclaimed, is to show the present an image of the past from which by history has escaped. So this is the idea is like we're going to use Native people and Native histories, but only to say basically what we don't want to be. What well, that is of the past here's what we're doing for the future and here's how we're going to progress. Yet really understanding that is, is this quote on the right says, if we are to begin to understand the experience of Native Americans, we have to challenge this tyranny which um, this view has established in our minds. That view of Native peoples of the past, of what we don't want to be, or we only want to be under this romanticism or ideas of beauty, versus literally what are the complexity of ways the diverse populations in that we know and I made reference to just a minute ago on that previous slide. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to keep showing you some more, but we have to know this is what's out there. And these are the things that we're trying to, to challenge with this kind of um, idea of presence. Okay, so last one on this idea of presence, I'm going to get, actually there's two more, I'm going to get more into some of these footprints. So in the end, however, the legends, the legends of origin stories, the legends of myths. So this is where we might have a little bit of space where people are paying attention to indigenous peoples, but they're not merely told for enjoyment. So in my class, we often talk about myths, but we rename it because myths are fables, myths are fiction. And this isn't what is, is true of indigenous values, again, beliefs. But that, you know, it's not merely for enjoyment or education or even for amusement. They are believed. You know, they're emblems of living religion, they're concrete forms of sets of beliefs and traditions that link people living today to their ancestors from countries and millennials of the past. You know, um, it, myth, in it, myth in its living, its primitive form, is not merely a, sto a story told, but a reality lived. And I think it's really important so that when we're understanding, like, again, the romanticism of naming things, it's not just about this tokenistic way of naming things, but the ways in which we're actually evoking um, what we seek to do in terms of our values and beliefs and ideologies. That's the presence that we try to do. That's why indigeneity is a verb, because it's action and the ways in which we connect to those beliefs. Next slide, please. Just trying to move through timing-wise here. Um, so, so again, we're countering this presence absence. So this is, again, this is Native American history timeline. This is National Geographic, actually. That's where I pulled this picture. So here's your timeline. Here's a bunch of chiefs. Again, no women. Everybody's in headdresses. You know, classic sepia. So we have this presence absent. That's the, the language that they're using here is that we're present. You all know us in these sepia images, right? But in this colonial imagination, we're absent in the sense that it reinforces a conviction that Native peoples are indeed vanishing or the conquest of Native lands is justified. So this is some of the stuff that's talked about even in the language of conquering or even in Sand Creek Massacre. Like I feel like those language are, are that we're going to call out Shivington and Evans, but then we individualize that. It's Shivington and Evans, but this is really about colonialism. It's about patriarchy. It's about nationalism that's cloaked as progress. And that's what happens here. When we can vanish the natives, we don't hold accountable those other types of situations. When we can destroy the buffalo, but don't hold accountable that it's policies that were put into place to actually pay for those things that are remnants of things that we do today around resources, the same kind of thing. So we're going to go to the next slide. And I'm going to get into specific footprints. And again, I'm just trying to make sure we have some time for some questions. So I tried to pull some things much more specifically to Pike's Peak under this idea of historicizing footprints. So on the left side, it says that, and th this information is taken from visit visitpikespeak.com or pikespeak.com, those two different sites. And there was a third one too that I pulled from. This is where the information came from. So it says on the left, the first successful summit, Pikes Peak, would not be summited successfully on record until 1820 when naturalist Edward James climbed it in much more pleasant weather. It wasn't exactly easy, but they got it done in two days. So one, we're going to name this first successful summit, right? Give a name and then even heroicize it even a little bit more and saying it gets done in two days. Yet on the right side, again, and this is information that's out there, but it's like, how are we then actually merging these actually conflicting and conflicting pieces of information? Because the history of Pikes Peak says, again, on the right side, the, though the Ute Indians were the first documented people around Pikes Peak, 
Pikes Peak, it's very unlikely, uh, it's very likely that a much younger generation of Native Americans roamed the Rockies some 12,000 years earlier, known as the Clovis culture. And these were descendants of ancient people who crossed the Bering Land Bridge between Russia and Alaska at the end of the last ice age. Here's one of the big things. I actually felt like this was useful until the very end of that paragraph. I don't know any native peoples who say that they came across the land, the land bridge. I don't know any that say that they came through the Bering Strait. So we, we're gonna give native history, but then we're gonna change it again. So this is one of the things that's problematic. And then even on this around the footprint in the 1700s, we um, know that the Ute Indians particularly also um, were referred to the blue skies people referred to the mountain as the Sun Mountain. Again, we know this, 1700s. Um, they believe that the entire world was created around this location. And again, going a little further, while there's no hard evidence that they reached the top of the peak, it's very likely they did scale the mountain since they set traps to obtain um, their ceremonial eagle feathers. So, so we actually even know that information, but over in this other side, we're saying, here's the first summit. And in the, in the latter part on the right side, I actually would change that a little bit more that, you know, there's evidence that they may have actually obtained these eagle feathers. I would, I would omit the trapping part because I think people tend to think trapping is killing and they wouldn't have done that. So just giving you some tweaks to some information that's out there, but you can clearly see conflicting information that's out there. So next slide, please. Um, and again, this is pretty dense in terms of the quote, but I'm trying to also make sure my time, I want to make sure we get a little bit of time for questions. Um, and so, so, and I know there's some stuff going on in chat and questions, but I can't do that right now because I'm trying to get through this, but I'll come back to it. So uh, again, so we were taught that the Americas at the Bering Strait about 13,000 years ago, they live small, isolated islands, again, remain mostly in the wilderness. But again, 13,000 years ago, that's what this land was. It was all wilderness. So I would, again, reframe some of this in terms of how it's being asked or how it's being presented, because it continues to present us as primitive. It continues to present us, again, as something of the past. So then go to the bottom right. This is indigenous perspective. The ancestor of the Arawak speaking people now called the, the Moha and Baruch, created of the largest strangers and most ecologically rich, created, let me do that one slower. They did create the largest, I don't know why they called it strangest, but the most ecologically rich artificial environment on the planet. These people built mounds for homes and farms. They constructed causeways and canals, and they had transportation and communication. They, cre they created the fish weirds to feed themselves and burn the savannas to keep um, clear of invading trees. Ecologically, the region is a treasure, but one designed and executed by human beings. So it's not even so much but there, but it shows we did this in, in our area. Certainly, um, you know, some of the stuff that we know of is, is the cache systems that they had for preserving food. I, I, I'm really curious, but I, my guess is that indigenous peoples were using ice. Um, again, because it's abundant here. And we always were looking at ways to engage in our environment and accentuate our con current conditions. You know, so we did do that, but yet we're still named in this other way around footprints. So next slide. And again, just moving through some of this quick because of time. Um, <clears throat> another way in which we see then, so we did footprints, but then we're going to do artifacts. And again, this is somewhat quickly. Article again, um, heavily ge geared towards children. Top of the left side is the name of the article. 13 facts about Native Americans you didn't learn in history class. Native Americans didn't always live in teepees and not all warriors were men. And I just pulled five of the 13. So Native Americans had diverse housing. Yes, yeah, sometimes the truth is complicated. This is this idea of challenging history. Then they say, guess who invented popcorn? Um, and then they also said each tribe has a different culture, but then Jim Thorpe was amazing. So there's still this way in which we, I don't know, I, I, I guess it's okay kids know that, you know, Native people had popcorn, but it, it still seems kind of trite. Versus on the left, on the bottom, you see that there are human artifacts and remains in Mexico, for example, that are dated more than 200,000 years old, an age which would challenge not only the contention that first people arrived in America via the Bering, Bering Strait theory, but also current ideas about human evolution. So this, again, really pushes the Bering Strait theory. Um, and there's other evidence that really does this too. But we're putting this in also in juxtaposition to what we're telling kids. Next slide, please. So um, getting closer to the bottom in terms of artifacts, this is even much more specifically about the Rocky Mountain National Park and this history. It's in chapter one. 
It says, when history is not written, humans speculate about the past. It takes quite an imagination to envision, you know, first human visitors. Again, a lot of questions there. I think for me, the biggest reason why I picked this quote is this idea that you have to imagine, right? You have to imagine, like, you know, did they stay long? Did they travel quickly? You have to imagine some of these things. And I, this is where I find contention, particularly on the right, the left bottom. Native Americans were unconcerned if their, if their neighbors' myths differed from their own. Their neighbors, after all, were created to be part of a landscape and would naturally understand their origins through stories that made sense of their own experiences. So part of this isn't so much that we don't have to imagine it, it is that quote particularly is allowing us to understand that we have different perspectives and we're okay with that. History tends to want to have a static, complete, um, one answer, one, um, one story, one narrative, and this is telling us that we have more. So let's go to the next slide again, because I think I'm running out of time. Um, so ways of knowing, this is much more looking at literally contemporary um, perspectives. Um, tribal knowledge was therefore not fragmented and it was valid within the historical geographic scope of the people's experience. Um, this is a tell. Um, whether it happened so or not, I don't know. But if you think about it, you can see that it is true. So this is one of those things, too, where particularly qualitative ethnographic work, we're going to look at, does it make sense? Does, is it consistent with things? Is it compatible to versus somehow I have to have it written down? So this is another way of understanding this history. On the right side, again, examples of ways of knowing being, these are three posters actually for the Native American Heritage Month that happened up at CSU the last three years. And you can't read the small print, but my intent here was one, is that if you look at the, the, the focus of the images, the, the, the center images, you know, where before you have this kind of like the sepia of the chiefs, the sepia of teepees, the sepia of horses, this is the imagery that's being presented in Native American Heritage Month. Quick asterisk there, it's Heritage Month, which is also pretty distinctive in terms of, I think, a real push from Indigenous community to say that we want to look at our heritage. And a number of the presentations, there's art, there's music, there's education, there's skills, there's tools, there's community gatherings. It's very, very typical in this State of American Heritage Month, a variety of ways in which you're actually reinforcing values. But again, what I'm pointing out there is look at the imagery that from within we're looking at representation around our heritage. Next slide, please. I only got like three more and um, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. So I also wanted to show like um, these are just a couple of the texts that I use. When I teach Native American history, I actually have, um, we do like 44 different articles and, and chapters, but these are a couple of them that when we look at how the Native peoples understand how our history has been told, certainly one of them is Custer died for your sins. So we're really looking at how is it that it, um, our colonizers, our white European early settlers really understand what happened, this idea of Tonto's revenge, the bottom one, a little matter of genocide. You know, so I think about that. I think about like what, what would happen if, we didn't talk about just like the idea of conquering, but we talked about genocide because that was the actual action that was happening. What happens if we rethink Sand Creek? I feel like Sand Creek has almost become this noun locally there where it's Sand Creek Massacre. We just call it Sand Creek, but Sand Creek was something before that. And what if we actually named the massacre in a way that really talks about that it was endorsed, you know, even though it was Shivington and people will critique that he did it on his own, but there's some way of being a colonel that this is the idea of what's rational and okay. Again, the opposite side of this, the great achievement for any generation would be to enlist a broad national consciousness in support of Indian peoples. And then there's this book called Real Indians that I use that actually starts to get into, well, what are the real Indians um, compared to these other ones that we get? Um, next slide, please. I know he's got two, two left um, and I'll wrap up. So ways of being, these are actually on the on the left. You can see native being native being Indian is a state of mind. Um, the images on the right are contemporary native artists, and actually, it's environmental justice issues. So some of this is literally these images are on people who are actually on the train tracks that you know really destroyed a number of things. Um, the bottom one is at a mining company, so you can see a different way in which we're trying to juxtapose some of the issues that have happened to their environment. The quotes, for Native American cultures and experience gains its significance not from um, when it happens, but from what it means. Um, in Native American stories, human beings are seen as integral part of natural order um, as whole of creation. Again, some particular ways of being. 
and you'll see these slides. You can pause them on the video when it was posted. The last slide I have is just a summary in terms of some things in which we might want to do around how we understand history. And remember, we're never steeped in history as when we pretend not to be. But if we stop pretending, we may gain an understanding what we lose in false innocence. Being naive is often an excuse for those who exercise power. For those upon whom that power is exercised, naive is always a mistake. And I hear this often, people like, I didn't know. It's like, and I often talk about that's your privilege of not knowing. Other quote here, history is the fruit of power, but power itself is never so transparent. Then it, then its analysis becomes superfluous. superfluous. The an ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility. The ultimate challenge is to expose its roots. And I think that's part of what your work is doing here, but I would remind us that that's our goal. Um, that's, that's me. I hope I didn't take up too much extra time. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Doreen. Um, at this point, I'd like to open up the floor and have our presenters all uh, unmute and turn their cameras back on. We'll sort of try and do a little bit of a QA. and uh, I know that we've had questions answered throughout the whole of this uh, in the chat, as well as in the Q&A. So, so we may have already hit a lot of these. Um, Another thing that I'll throw out there is, Doreen, you've cruised through that, and I feel like I missed so much, so I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for us to release the, the YouTube, just so I can go back and be like, okay, this is where she's going here, okay, got it. So, I feel like I have questions, but I need to review and make sure you didn't answer them. So, no, I, I appreciate that. It's, it's striking because I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep it like to 16, 17 slides. It's only 20 minutes. And then I end up putting like four quotes on one slide. And I'm like, ah, jeez. Um, but yeah. That's the, the beauty and the fun and the challenge of the symposium is that is you have to go, is the pacing's all over the place. Okay, on that note, I know that we, the, one of the very first questions that we got was, a uh, question of actually about uh, Sand Creek. Um, it was about how the legacy of Irving Halbert and how has it changed um, over time? I think that one was directed to Kathy, but Doreen, if you want to jump in here at some point too, I think that you'd have a, a good perspective as well. So Kathy, you want to take that one? Um, yes, and first I want to thank my fellow panelists for amazing topics and discussion. Thank you so much. I learned so much. Um, in using some of what Doreen just talked about, I think that Irving Halbert is actually a great example as an individual representing what he was part of and a time he lived in from a classic historical perspective that um, it was not some isolated event, but very representative of the community at the time. And if we were able to keep him in that box and say, does he, did he represent the community at the time and, and to a large extent still? Yeah, you know, so, you know, he's not some kind of individual criminal. What he ends up doing though, is as a historian, not in the academic sense, but as a participant historian, um, he writes about it, he publishes about it, he defends it, he builds that whole point of view into a book that's labeled the history of Indians in the Pikes Peak region. And when people come here and hope to see what's already here on that subject, they find Irving Halbert's perspective, which is a valid historical, you know, sort of period piece of perspective. Um, so he is a man of his times, but it's his perspective is one that I hope is not the same and we're all trying to adjust. Um, so yes, he's definitely undergoing uh, the viewpoint of, of revisionists and Native Americans. We have a current activity in town of, that started with the different uh, educational and, and business institutions like Pikes Peak Community College of doing land acknowledgement. And so as people try to compose those, as people seek um, indigenous groups and activists to help them do that, then all of those resources are coming into question and Irving is certainly one of those. 
I think there's <laughs> a little bit on that. I don't, we're echoing horribly. Is that better? It's fine. All right. All right. Um, I think that part of it though too is like we have to be careful of the parameters of when we bring people in. Because I think it sets up even certain answers by, you know, revisionists or even by, you know, um, even indigenous participants. You know, so if we come in with this parameter of like, how do we attend to this particular narrative, right? Then we're just looking at attending to that potential narrative. And what it is is that we have to change it, you know, in a much more, you know, broader way. You know, so so I think that there's a there's a way of kind of noting to me some of the significance is noting what is it that fed into that initial narrative because that that to me is the whole critique of Shivington and Evans and I definitely think there's ways in which we need to critique Shivington and Evans but if we don't tie that into issues of nationalism if we fail to tie that into literally issues of occupation if we fail to tie that into literally issues of like patriarchy and you know masculinity at some level that's why we have some of the same issues now you know in, in regards to what's happening so to me it's it's potentially expanding and pushing that out more. It's actually, again, even allowing like what would happen. And it's changed a little bit. I mean, for Native peoples, they'll probably do much more around Sand Creek and the memorial. But then even then, like, I know like for some younger generations, that they, they want to know when can we be contemporary, not just memorialized. So what would that space look like if we allowed it to be contemporary? I think it's a huge question. And we don't allow that. We, we've kind of, we've taken it and, and, and kind of like almost been rigid and it's kind of like, no, it needs to be in this kind of container or else we're failing. As a native student who's doing a project, I'm like, can you do Sand Creek prior to the massacre? That's what I want. I want Sand Creek prior to it. Like, what do we learn then? And not just about the people, you know, but what do we learn about Sand Creek? What do we learn about the land? What do we learn about the ecology? So, so that's even like, you know, the, the idea of land acknowledgement, somebody put here in the chat, I know there's another question up here I want to get to, um, you know, but land acknowledgements rarely, you know, recognize the land, it's the people that were there prior. So we're reifying a Western expectation around some of this. So some of the work that I've done, we've really pushed to like recognize the land and what does it mean? But I, and what would be, what would it be if you, instead of calling it Sand Creek Massacre, I don't know, I, this is kind of trite, but it's like Shivington, Mass Shivington Massacre. Because with Shivington, they did it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the stuff. Like, and that may not be the best answer immediately, but that's where I would want to push things. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and land acknowledgement is, is, I completely understand the motives, I think, behind doing it as having good intentions. But it is, it is one of those sort of narrowing false constructs. And I agree with you, I can't think of very many of the samples I've read that focus on the land. Yeah. Um, they're focusing on who lived there. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, see if you, we have a land acknowledgement. I think one of the things that was really distinctive is it was all done by Native peoples. So it's, it's a different tone. It's actually a call to action. We created a video that's like, 85% of it, I think, is all outside. It's in the land. It's literally in the streams. It's, in, you know, um, and I think that that's part of it. I think that it's become one of those things that's almost gotten over, over popular and trendy. So then I think that's when we have to call it back, you know, in terms of like, well, what does it mean to do this? So one of the organizations I'm working with, Boulder County Open Spaces and Parks, we're actually looking at doing more of a land commitment and then how do you, you know, reinforce principles of indigenous peoples as your land commitment, which in many ways could also then give a reference historically, but it centers it differently in terms of what you would say primary focus is. I think that we have another question in uh, the Q&A for you, Doreen. Um, when looking at the history, we look at an overview, but how does the individual's experience both then and now fit in? And how do we integrate that individual with the whole in your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, I think we can't, I think we can't see them as separate. I think that, and if anything, I would say we do the overview and we may use individual stories to highlight particular things or maybe to give um, a concrete iterative. Here's the thing, here's the thing that's, that's troubled or maybe a little more difficult. Um, and I'm thinking of the individual experience that we have around histories. It's journals, it's you know, autobiographies, it's those type of things. 
you know, and that's where you can maybe get, but, but it's difficult because there's a way in which there's only certain, certain one, certain journals, certain biographies in which we've recognized. And it's like military biographies, even slave ones or autobiographies. And excuse me, there's some from some women, um, but it's even like, it was striking about, actually, I, I was, I was struck with like the, you know, the founding of Pikes Peak. And I, I think Kathy, you might have mentioned that it was part of like the land claim, but you had to then abide by like temperance and morality. It's like, wait a second, like, wait, like, and that to me is a great example of living history, though, because it says only certain ones get to have a history, right? You know, the idea there's there's it's funny and somewhat the title of, of the symposium is like the naughty part. I'm like, well, who who are truly the naughty ones? Like, who 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 really are the naughty ones are that we've labeled that. So in that question, I think we have to be really, I think we have to be beholden to the overview. I think that's the primary one, because I think that we get more than an individual anomaly or, again, somebody to scapegoat, which I think is, is sometimes the situation. Um, we can have, like, you know, they're true stories, but what if that perspective doesn't really land consistency? You know, I think that sometimes it feels more comfortable to like watch the documentary or individual biography. I think that they're useful because I think they humanize situations, which often people have a really difficult time doing. They think again a bit too abstract if we say too too um, broad, but I think it has to be connected to that broad. And again, I would default to the broad and tie in. There's tons of examples that you can always bring in without it having to be truly an individual kind of um, narrative, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got a couple quick ones here. Uh, Steve, do you know when, do you know where on Cheyenne Creek Mr. Johnson had his ice ponds? I do not know exactly where it was at. Okay. Just, uh, over by the mouth of the canyon as near as I could tell during research. Got it. And then, then there was one for Kathy. When was the springs added to the town name of Manitou? Any idea? When, when do you mean when did Manitou Springs get its name? Is that what we're asking? I think we had, I think you had uh, said something that it was originally just Manitou and then it was, then the springs was added later. No, I don't think so. It was right. Manitou Springs, as far as I know, when they developed it in 72. Perfect. Well, that means that, thank you for clarifying. <laughs> um, I think, let me check and see if there's any more questions that are around here. Yes, I want to ask Steve a clarifying question. Steve, you said it was like 90,000 people were part of the um, ice industry. That Was that just local? No, nationwide. That was nationwide. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just have a comment for Steve. I just think that this is so, so important to helping people understand technology and daily life in the past. I think most of my students, whenever there are occasions when I mention ice delivery or something about uh, the use of ice or ice trucks or whatever, and anytime I've ever mentioned it, they stop me I because they don't know what I'm talking about and I, I have to I, and I have to explain it no. so I think it's 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 one of those things that and I it's sort of relevant in a general way to the bigger points that Doreen you were making that we have these pockets of of social history and information about the past that we just sort of leave unattended to because there may may be from everyday life of a lot of people and were not considered noteworthy even at the time. And so now we don't even realize how people did things in the past. And I think this is, I think your study was great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on that note, I think we blasted through all the, the questions, uh, both in the chat and the Q&A. I think the one final question that popped into the Q&A was, are we doing a 2022 symposium <laughs> and what the topic is? I, I don't know who asked that one. I'm just going to let that one simmer. Um, but yes, we will be doing a 2022 symposium uh, and we are still in the process of working out the topic. Um, we will probably put out a call for proposals uh, by the end of this symposium series. Uh, so we are a little bit ahead of schedule um, in presentation. Uh, but the call for proposals will be coming out uh, somewhere throughout this, this four-month span that we will be uh, conducting. 
Um, I want to say thank you to all, to all of our present presenters, as well as all of the audience members. You all could have been anywhere in the world today and you chose to spend your time with us. Um, that's saying something a lot. Um, so I want to say thank you very much to everyone, um, both presenters and uh, to our attendees. So thank you very much. And we do have another uh, symposium, I believe it is on Saturday, June 26th. That's our next one. Uh, they are once a month through August. So if you are not signed up, please take a look. Um, sign up if you like it. Um, and hopefully we see folks again. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon.